الشعب صوت يقهر الأنظمة فلتسقط الحكومة الظالمة للشعب صوت يقهر الأنظمة فلتسقط الحكومة الظالمة ثورتنا قادمة 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 Assalamu alaikum dear viewers and welcome back to our Bahrain special show regarding the situation in Bahrain and appeal to humanity. Now as we said before the break that we will be having a live interview with Sayyid Mehdi Mubarisi, but um, we do apologize for the short delay in, um, in conducting that interview. But alhamdulillah now we have Sayyid Mehdi Mubarisi on the line, so inshallah we'll be um, speaking to him now. Assalamu alaikum Sayyid. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah sister to you and to the team. Uh, as well as uh, our dear viewers. Thank you very much. Just for the audience at home, I'm sure you all saw Sayyid Mehdi speak some very important points mentioned. But inshallah now I'll be um, asking him more questions in specific. Um, Sayyid, first I wanted to ask you regarding the situation in Bahrain. I mean, there hasn't been much uh, media coverage, um, mainstream media coverage on the situation in Bahrain. And we've been receiving some phone calls from individuals saying exactly what is happening in Bahrain. Uh, many people are uninformed of the current situation. If you could speak more about that. Well, as you said, sister, uh, there has been a media blockade of the situation in Bahrain. It's as though uh, not only are there other headlines uh, that are overshadowing the situation, the, the very dismal uh, circumstances uh, that we're witnessing in Bahrain, but it seems that there is a systematic attempt by mainstream media uh, to completely ignore the atrocities and the uh, carnage that's taking place over there. <laughs> Chris, we spend a lot of time on the program talking about Libya, but what's happening in Bahrain is more violent and of much more strategic interest to the United yeah, States. Because of oil. Beca because of oil and because of the fiscal is stationed there. What happens in Bahrain is really critical to America, but it's in Washington's interest and the White House's interest that we don't report this story very much. They would like that one to go away because there's no real upside for them in supporting the rebellion by the Shiites. How, how is not reporting it help? Because they just don't want too much attention uh, focused on what's happening there because they don't want to be having to be pushed into a position of, of uh, helping the Shiite rebels there. Uh, I mean, let, let me take you just a step back uh, and give our, our dear viewers uh, a little overview about uh, the regime that is in place in Bahrain. And let me just say before I talk about that, I don't care about the politics. Uh, uh, it's not the political aspect that we're trying to uh, shed light upon here. What we're trying to get people to realize is how dire the humanitarian situation is. Because, I mean, it's a long-established and abundantly documented fact that authorities in Bahrain have practiced systematic discrimination and brutal repression of its majority Shia population for years. Um, and, uh, you know, things like political imprisonment, documented cases of torture, cold-blooded murder of peaceful civilians. Um, now, right now, we're facing a tragedy of unprecedented proportions. Um, Saudi forces have entered the country under the, uh, the guise of the Gulf Cooperation Council, the GCC. Uh, Bahrain Shias face the possibility of sheer sectarian cleansing, as I've said in, in other uh, uh, talks and interviews, uh, which is being perpetrated by those who label Shias as apostates, heretics, and Zoroastrians that must be eliminated by swords. If you do a quick search on Twitter, Facebook and YouTube posts and comments, um, that will reveal the venomous hatred towards the Shia population, the majority population that is in Bahrain. It's an enmity that fuels anti-Western violence by Al-Qaeda terrorists, who are Wahhabis, by the way. It's that same enmity that is now being carried out, that is now being manifested by the Saudi forces, the Wahhabi Saudi forces, uh, with guns. Um, which leaves one wondering if there is any way out for all the vulnerable Shias in Bahrain. Um, the situation right now is very bad, sister. The fact of the matter is that for a while there was a little bit of media coverage. Uh, you had the New York Times, the uh, Wall Street Journal, you had other mainstream media outlets trying to focus in on what's happening in that very strategic area. Um, after that, however, uh, it's, it's as though there's nothing happening. At a meeting in Paris with the U.S. Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, the Emirates' foreign minister said his country was simply answering a call for help. The Bahraini government asked us yesterday to, to look at ways uh, to help them to refuse the tension in Bahraini. 
The UAE is currently the president of the Gulf Cooperation Council, and he is here representing the GCC, so we will have a, a very comprehensive discussion. We have already sent uh, roughly around 500 of our uh, police force uh, who, who are there. Uh, the Saudis are there as well. Uh, there are other Gulf countries which are going to participate uh, to support the Bahraini government and to get calm uh, and order in Bahrain and to help both uh, the Bahraini government and people to reach to a solution which is uh, for the best for the Bahraini people. Well, the reality of the matter is Right now, the authorities, after cracking down in a very brutal way on the peaceful demonstrators who were there trying to ask for very simple human rights, after getting them all to go back to their homes, with the, and, 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 and in, in doing so, also killing dozens of people, there are over 120 people who are um, uh, imprisoned. We know that they've been arrested, um, and, and there are at least 60 people missing. And we've received reports, sister, very disturbing reports about the bodies of the dead as well as those who were injured being taken across the, the sea to Saudi Arabia, where they were taking, taken into the, uh, uh, the city of Khobar, and they were taken to the hospital morgue, even though some of them were still alive. We've received reports from that very hospital, the King Fahad Hospital, uh, uh, the King Fahad Educational Hospital of Khobar, saying that we saw bodies being taken to the morgue and the, the doors sealed shut upon them, even though some of them were still moaning. The fact well, is, sister, we've got people missing, we've got people who are confirmed arrested or killed, and right now what they're doing is that they're raiding homes after 3 a.m. Each night, this is what they're doing. They're raiding people's homes. They are arresting people randomly. They're stopping people at checkpoints, asking them for their names. If their name happens to be Ali Hassan Hussein Jafar or anything remotely resembling a Shia identity, they're ar arrested on the spot. They're breaking into houses in the middle of the night, and in one confirmed case, and I, I'd like to mention the person's name as well, though I'm sure that the family would be very disturbed, but this is an oppression that needs, that needs to be told. The family of Salah Khawaja, who's a very close family friend of ours, they attacked his home in the middle of the night, his house was raided, they not only ambushed the house and took him in, they then started beating his wife. They, they, they started pulling her by the hair and they beat her so bad that one of her ribs is broken. Sister, we're talking about a humanitarian disaster that the world is simply not willing to hear about. We have the sister, he's a, she's a Sayyid by the way, she's a Sayyid. Her ribs are broken. And this in itself reminded me of the tragedy of Fatima to Zahra. And I want to appeal to viewers all over the world, brothers, sisters, no matter what your political persuasions, no matter what your uh, uh, ethnic uh, uh, denominations, no matter what religion you subscribe to, I swear to God, this is a tragedy that needs to be stopped. And I ask you not to wait for your sovereign governments. Don't wait for your governments to intervene. Because I'm sorry, for some reason they don't want to intervene. When you have someone like Aung San Suu Kyi, the famous Burmese um, human rights activist and opposition leader, you have the whole world talking about her, even though she's under house arrest. She's in her home, in the comfort of her house. I'm not saying she doesn't deserve the attention. I'm, you know, anybody who's, who's under oppression anywhere around the world needs to have people to step up and ask for their rights to be reestablished. But also see Tzu Chi is being under house arrest. And yet the whole world seems to be occupied about getting her out of uh, uh, her, uh, her house arrest and getting the Burmese government to, to face justice. You have Chinese dissidents being taken to prison, and it shouldn't happen. But what I'm saying is a Chinese opposition individual, an opposition figure, gets imprisoned, and suddenly he's, an, he's awarded a Nobel Peace Prize. What, what's happening with the international community? Why don't we have people strongly condemning the atrocious nature of the, of the raids that are taking place after 3 a.m. each night in Bahrain? The, the situation, my sister, uh, as, as you know full well, you're a Bahraini, uh, you're of Bahraini origin yourself. 
I, I have many, many friends, very dear childhood friends who are from Bahrain. I'm in constant touch with uh, some of them who are still able to communicate by email or Facebook or Twitter or phone calls or any other means uh, uh, in Bahrain, trying to just get an understanding of what's happening. This regime is a brutal one. Again, I don't care about the politics. But what I do care about and what I want to make sure the rest of the world cares about, especially our dear viewers, is that the people who came out on February 14th, um, do you know what they're asking for? What, what were their demands? Some of you might not understand the context of, of, of the situation in Bahrain. They came out not asking for food. They came out not asking for government handouts. It, it, these weren't their demands. You know what they asked for? They asked for a prime minister, Sheikh Khalifa bin Isa bin Salman. A man, uh, Khalifa bin Salman, excuse me. Khalifa bin Salman is the prime minister of Bahrain who's been in power for the last 43 years. I mean, the world talks about democratic uh, uh, reforms. The world talks about human rights. The world talks about trying to get people to, 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 to ease the restrictions that they're going through in their country. We have a premier who's been in charge for 43 years. 24 um, Italian prime ministers changed governments while this guy was still in charge. Eight U.S. presidents changed hands while this guy was still in charge. I mean, imagine if you had a prime minister uh, of, of Britain, for instance, or a prime minister of uh, Canada, who was in power since World War II. Wouldn't that be absolutely ridiculous? Yeah. And so you have people who are saying enough is enough. We've had enough of this guy. And they came out asking in the most peaceful terms. They came out saying that we don't want him. We're not going to carry weapons. Let me tell you something about some of the lies that the government is, is saying right now. And the whole world knows this. The government is now talking about people who were violent. Just today, the uh, uh, interior minister came and said that the violent nature of the, of the protesters, the pro-democracy protesters, that is, is what caused the deaths of four police officers. So you have four people dying on the, on the, on the government side, and dozens of people missing, arrested, and killed on the, dem on the demonstrator's side, and no one seems to care. But he came out and he condemned the violent nature of the people of Bahrain. Anybody who has access to YouTube, you don't need to watch television. You don't, you don't need to go to a mainstream media outlet. Forget all of those. Go to YouTube. Go to Facebook. Go to any of those social media networks. And you'll know without a shadow of doubt that the people of Bahrain were more peaceful, peaceful than anybody else. Let me tell you something. Colonel Gaddafi is a vicious cruel, despotic, uh, tyrannical individual. He's a liar. He de he's a deceiver. He's a person who, who, who deserves everything that he's getting right now. But anybody who watches the reports, the news reports of what's happening on the ground in Libya will see an opposition which is armed with artillery, with tanks, with, with guns that could shoot down planes. And yet no one seems to be bothered by that. As the opposition is trying to bring down a tyrannical regime, they may do so with whatever means available to them. But the people of Bahrain never took up arms. The people of Bahrain never carried a single weapon. Not even a cold weapon was ever carried. I dare anybody to get me a, a video or some solid proof that the people of Bahrain used any kind of violence. All the pictures, all the videos show people carrying roses walking up to, to armed military personnel, offering them a red rose. Don't you think that if they had any weapons, they'd use them at some stage? If not use them uh, as a deterrent in order to stop the government with their, with their uh, uh, oppressive, brutal crackdown, at least use them in order to, to protect their lives. And not once did we ever see that happening. They didn't even carry, sorry sister, they never even carried a single knife, not even a cold weapon, which is available in any kitchen. They never even carried a stick. All they carried were roses and the national flag of Bahrain. This government, and again, I don't care about the politics. What I care about is the humanitarian situation. 
where hospitals are shut down. This woman, the Sayyid, the woman that I spoke about, whose ribs are broken. And, and anybody who's ever experienced that kind of pain knows that every breath of air that you take, every inhalation and exhalation is torture. This woman can't go to the hospital to get treatment. Her friends and family were calling us saying, is there a way we could get her to go and receive medical treatment overseas? Why can't she go to a hospital? Because as a Shia, she can't approach the hospital. Because they've got checkpoints checking whether they check your ID cards. If they find out you're a Shia, they stop you. If they can't tell by your name, they tell by, by the village you, you live in. If they can't even do that, you know what they do? They, they speak with you and they can tell by your dialect and your accent. So the, the situation is really bad, and, 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 and I don't know how, how much worse it's going to get. But I just need the world to know that this is intolerable. We can't tolerate this. Something needs to be done. Oh, that's definitely true. I mean, like you said, the atrocities there have really increased. I mean, just um, I was speaking to a young man yesterday. His name is Ali um, in Bahrain. He was saying that he was trying to get to Salmani Hospital, and he was injured. And there was actually five checkpoints just to get to Salmani Hospital. And each checkpoint, they would search the car and search him. And um, at the second checkpoint, he was actually beaten up, and um, his car was searched, and he was beaten up really brutally. And it took him two days to get home. And by the time he got home, his injuries were really increased. And um, you know, and he still can't get to hospital to for treatment. But I mean, when we see the current news that are happening in Bahrain, I have two questions. First of all, I mean, we've seen the abductions taking place now, like Abu Ghraib al Alawi and other religious figures, and Sheikh. Um, and Shuk and other religious figures, and we also see, um, you know, mosques being destroyed, such as Masjid al Zahra and um, Masjid Sa'a and Masjid Sheikh Maytham, and other masjids being burnt down with the Qurans and the Du'as and the prayer mats all, um, all inside. I mean, is this a direct festival? Is this a direct attack against the Shia? It seems as if, you know, pulling down banners and burning mosques which belong to the Shia and attacking and raiding their houses is a direct attack on the Shia. That's number one. And second, um, regarding what you said, I mean, why isn't the mainstream media reporting on this? Is there a hidden agenda in the situation in Bahrain? I mean, why don't we see the same coverage of what we see in Libya and other countries? If you could explain more on these people. Well, uh, as for the first point, sister, without a doubt, what we are witnessing today is a new kind of ethnic cleansing, something that the world hasn't really seen anything like it, uh, at least in recent history. This is, as I've, as I've said before, over and over again, it is a form of sectarian cleansing. You have uh, members of a single family. Imagine that, a single family ruling the, the, the country for the past two and a half centuries, 230 years. Imagine if you had a government in the United Kingdom ruling since Queen Victoria's age. Uh, 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 all, all, all the way from her time up to this time, the same family keeps on inheriting uh, the, the, the power and the authority uh, to one another. Uh, this family also happens to subscribe to a minority sect in Bahrain. And so when, when you're a member of a minority sect and you happen to rule a country where the majority happens to subscribe to a different sect, obviously you're going to feel threatened. Obviously, you won't feel comfortable because you know that you're an oppressor. You know that you've transgressed. And you know that in order for you to maintain your grip on power, you need to subject your subjects, your citizens, to the most brutal forms of, of oppression. And so what they've done is that for the last 50 years or so, no Shia is allowed to have any post in the interior ministry. That means that not only can they not ever be in the ranks of the army, but above that, even more so, they, a Shia cannot even be a police officer. A Shia cannot even become a traffic control officer. Not even someone who stands by the side of the road and, and, and controls or manages the, the flow of traffic. Even that a Shia cannot do. Clearly what we have is an attack, a very direct attack, on the majority Shia population of Bahrain. And some Western journalists, uh, who have been honest in their reporting, they have spoken about this. 
um, I mean, you have Kristoff from the New York Times, for instance. Um, he says that uh, I was there with uh, with a colleague of mine, and at some stage in the in the in the middle of the mayhem, they came to us, and someone pointed a gun to my friend's face, and my friend immediately pulled out his American passport and says, uh, "I'm an American." And so as soon as the, the, the uh, military personnel realize that wh the person they're dealing with is, a, is an American foreign uh, uh, correspondent, they, they, the leader comes up to him and, and, and he says to him that we love Americans. We don't have a problem with you. We hate the Shia. And the reporter says that the way he spoke about the Shia was as though he was talking about hunting down rats. Sister, what we have today is, is sectarian cleansing at its worst. And this is why you have the Shia being targeted at checkpoints, you have the Shia being targeted not being allowed into hospitals, you have the Shia being killed, because the, the government can't hold a balance of power unless they destroy and obliterate. Now, you mentioned uh, something about the destruction of holy sites. Yeah. Now, we're talking about the shrines of companions companions to the prophet, companions to the commander of the faithful, who have, uh, uh, who have had their shrines and their mausoleums desecrated, demolished, destroyed, copies of the Qur'an being burnt, copies of, of, of uh, Mafatih al-Junan, a book of supplications, supplications, speaking to God. Those are being burnt, posters being brought down, and the other day channel is showing that clip over and over again, where you have a Saudi military officer coming to this poster, which, which all it's showing is a, is, a, is a picture of the shrine of Imam Hussein. And you can see the hatred right there. You can see the venomous scorn that he displays when he begins to kick and tear down the poster simply because it resembles the Shia faith. Forgetting the fact that this is a picture of the shrine of the, of the prophet's grandson. Now when you see things like that, you realize that those who killed Imam Hussein uh, uh, in, in Karbala on the day of Ashura, they were only the ancestors of these same individuals. Just today, sister, and this is the most alarming thing that came out today and, and last night as well. Two statements that were made, and I want to make sure everyone realizes just how uh, um, how important and how dangerous these two st statements are. The first one is by the Prime Minister, again, the guy who's been in charge for the last 43 years. He came out and said, Bahrain is doing well. We will rebuild the nation, and we will never say that we will forgive the past. What that is, brothers and sisters, is an ultimatum. No, it's worse than an ultimatum. It's a direct threat that as soon as the dust settles down, we're going to hunt you down like the rats that we perceive you to be. What he's saying is, we, will, we won't forget the fact that you demonstrated peacefully, taking off your shirts in the street, raising your hands and saying, peaceful, peaceful, while you were being shot in the face point blank by, by, by tanks and artillery and helicopters and choppers flying overhead, shooting people down like animals. He said, we won't forget what you did because you ruined our image, you exposed our hideous faith in the, in, the, in the world, we won't forget that. We'll come and hunt you down. That's the first statement. The second statement was made by a guy, he's, a, he's an MP, he's a member of parliament, by the name of Saidi. Sister, you probably uh, know who this person is. He came out today. Uh, there are pictures over, uh, of him, by the way, on the internet, where he's, ra he's holding a, a sword, and rallying his, his, his friends to go and kill the Shia with swords. Yeah. I appeal, let me just open two brackets here, I appeal to the international community, not to the world governments. I've, all, I've already given up on those. I appeal to the human rights organizations. I appeal to the organizations that protect the rights of women and children. I appeal to anyone who holds anything sacred, any ideal, any, any, any ethic or morality, come and help and save the people of Bahrain from these individuals. He's, this is the 21st century we're talking about. He's holding swords saying, let's go and kill these people because they're heretics and they're Zoroastrians, addressing the, the Muslim, innocent, peaceful Shia of Bahrain. Yeah. Do you know what he said today, sister? He made a statement addressing the commander-in-chief of the army yeah. in Bahrain. And he said, now that things are starting to settle down, 
let's, let's apply the rule of law. By destroying every single house of worship that is not registered in the government. Do you know what that means? In Bahrain, there are 4,000 Husayniyat, Imam Bargas, places of worship, where the Shia go to do what? Sister, you know full well. Our viewers know full well. What do Shias do in their Imam Bargas and in their Husayniyya? They go there to cry. They sit down. They remember the, the tragedies of the Imams and the Ahlul Bayt and the household of the Prophet, and they weep and sob over them. He came out today and said, the Saidi, he came out and said, every single one of those needs to be raised to the ground. 4,000 Husayniyat. Now, whether he's eventually able to do this or not, this is his intention. This is what he's trying to do. Where is the United Nations? Where is the, uh, uh, all those organizations defending, you know, trying to, to, to create World Heritage Sites? Where is UNESCO? Where are those international organizations? I mean, like you said, it's, well, anyone I've seen to Bahrain, there are many mosques out there, and we can already see them beginning to tear down and destroy many of them aside within the mosque. I mean, as for the second question, um, I asked in terms of why isn't the mainstream media reporting on this? I mean, the, the reports I get from Bahrain when speaking to people living in Bahrain, um, I was speaking to a family, they said that each night they sleep in different homes because they fear that their home may be raided and, um, and they may be abducted. I know also women that have been physically assaulted by the police and by the armed forces when they came to arrest their husbands and also when they're in the streets, they've been shot at as well, women and children. I mean, as a Bahraini myself in this current situation, I fear returning back because I spoke against Al Khalifa. It seems like we don't even have a voice and we can't speak against injustice. I mean, like I said, why, why isn't the mainstream media reporting this? Is there some sort of hidden agenda um, regarding all this? Or is it it's very simple. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. It's very simple. The reason the mainstream uh, uh, media isn't reporting on the situation in Bahrain is because Saudi money goes a long way in, in, in making people's attention spans get just a hell of a lot shorter. Mm. Because there is money and there is strategic interest because there's oil, because there's gas, because business is, is, uh, uh, is at stake, because you have banks with their headquarters or their regional branches um, that are uh, uh, in Bahrain because the world simply cannot afford, financially speaking, it can't afford to have any kind of unrest in Bahrain being reported to the outside world. As I mentioned, in China, if there is any kind of unrest, Suddenly you have the world community coming together, condemning in the strongest terms what's happening over there. And so they should. In, in, in Burma, in, in other uh, regions around the world, if there is anything happening to any minority group, suddenly the world is, is, you know, is crying out, trying to bring an end to the transgressions. However, in Bahrain, because there was a recent BBC report that came out saying uh, that the uh, Gulf regimes in uh, the, the, the UK, specifically in London, they're spending massive amounts of money on PR campaigns. They're reaching out to reporters. They're trying to get um, uh, lobby groups and PR groups trying to create a better image of the country in spite of the, of the, of, uh, of the blatant human rights violations that are taking place on the ground. And so money, you know, money talks and money walks, and it's, it's very difficult to, to, to face that. Um, but I, I think the other problem is that we ourselves are not trying to, to speak up, and we're not conveying the message of the people of Bahrain to the rest of the world. And I think it's one thing to blame the mainstream media, and, and it's a totally different thing for us to realize just what we have to do in order to make sure that the atrocities do not take place there. That's definitely true. I mean, for all the viewers, I mean, we've all heard your, um, we heard your speech and, you know, some powerful words. And many people have emailed in saying, okay, then we want, to get in, we want to get involved and we want to take action. I mean, you've highlighted some points in your speech, for, but for the viewers watching now, what can we do? I mean, what should we do now? I know action has to be taken from all of us. So what can we do now, to, in a sense, to help the oppressed people in Bahrain? Well, it's a very good question. I think a lot of people... Uh, are, are trying to find uh, their own answer to, to this question. There, there may not be one single answer to it. Um, but I think if we go back to our religious, to our moral, to our uh, humane duties towards other people, we'll realize 
that for instance you hear uh, uh, the, the narration of the Prophet where he says Man asbaha wa lam yahtam bi umur al muslimin He who wakes up not being concerned with the affairs of other Muslims uh, It's a very famous prophetic hadith He who wakes up in the morning not having any kind of concern, worry or distress about what's happening in the world to, to other uh, Muslim brothers and sisters uh, he is, uh, uh, this person has nothing to do with Islam. So not only is he or she not a Muslim, they have nothing, they've learned nothing from the, from the lessons of Islam. And I think the very first step start, starts right there. We should feel a sense of grief, a sense of concern, a sense of anxiety, a sense of depression at what's happening to the people of Bahrain. Just today, um, on a personal level, sister, I... Um, uh, just after uh, Salatul Maghrib, I, I kind of felt down, uh, and, and I don't know why that is. I, I just, you know, felt a little bit depressed, and then suddenly I reminded myself, I said, you know, imagine if I was in Bahrain right now, in, in my home, at 3 a.m., expecting the, the government troops to raid my house any second, how would I feel? I'd obviously feel much, much worse than I am right now. Um, and, and, I, and I think it has to start with that inner uh, feeling of, of concern and grief and worry. And from that, you will find that we will begin to find our own path to, to making sure that these atrocities come to an end in Bahrain. For instance, I know a very good sister um, whose name is Sister Sukaina in, uh, in Toronto, who, mashallah, has been a very active. You know her very well, Sister. Yes. She's been going around sending emails, petitions, links, uh, news stories to whoever she knows on her Facebook you know, page and uh, using other means. And, you know, just, I think it was yesterday or today when she got a, uh, an article published in the Toronto Star in Canada uh, yes. quoting her message saying that I'm very concerned by, by, by the lack of reporting on the situation in Bahrain. So this is something very simple that everybody can do. I mean, we all have access to the Internet. We all have our you know, email addresses. Send uh, messages everywhere. Get people to begin to care. This is what we're trying to do here. I mean, if we're going to call for a rally tomorrow in, in Washington, D.C., or in London, or in Paris, or Sydney, we want to make sure that we have the grassroots support. We want to make sure that people care enough about their brothers and sisters in Bahrain who are going through these very, very difficult times uh, so that they would actually step up and, and go out and make their voices heard. Um, other than that, I would also encourage people to try and help uh, the families of the injured, uh, the families of, the, of those who are imprisoned and tortured right now, and those who are martyred in Bahrain, to help them financially. Um, I don't know if you saw this, sister, but there was a CNN report which dates back to 2007. I just came across this by, by accident. Uh, I was going through videos about Bahrain on YouTube. Look it up, you'll find it. And the report is about poverty in Bahrain. It's by CNN. You can find it easily. And it starts off by showing one side of the country where you've got skyscrapers, you know, uh, 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 basically uh, in one part of the country. And then you have a very, very different picture elsewhere. In the Shia villages, there is nothing but sheer poverty. And the reporter, she goes into somebody's home, and she begins to interview the family members, uh, starting by showing uh, the father and the son and the sister and the mother, this very small family, which lives in a, in a run-down home that, I mean, I, I can't see anybody being able to live in such a, in such a, uh, 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 in such a house. It's not even a house. It's, you know, I don't know what, what they've made it uh, from. So, so what shocked me was is that that same young man who was featured in the 2007 CNN report on poverty in Bahrain, a very young man, is the same person whose skull was shut, uh, was, was, was basically blown off by one of the government's mercenaries who attacked this young man and brought his very young life to a very abrupt ending by blowing his head. And, and yes. Yeah, I mean, like I said, I saw that video as well, and I'm sure many people have seen that video, that that's why people are beginning to say that people are being targeted and the government are trying to silence people by targeting them. I mean, we have a few minutes um, left, but just to end it off, I mean, um, I'm sure many of you have heard your, your message, and I hope people begin to take action and get in contact with us. 
But um, a question in Bahrain, I mean, has been going on for years and years and years, if not hundreds of years, since Al Khalifa um, um, became, um, got the power in Bahrain. Can you speak um, about more, you know, has this been a um, long-going oppression in Bahrain? Because many people think this is just a burst of oppression that's just happened due to the protests. Um, can you just shed more light on that? Uh, well, as I said, the, the oppression has been taking place for a very long time. If you see the 2010 uh, um, uh, Human Rights Watch um, report on torture in Bahrain, it will give you a very, very dark picture of what happens when somebody is, um, is imprisoned or arrested in that, in that part of the world. You have people like the current prime minister, who, as I said, has been in power for the last 43 years, longer than Hosni Mubarak, longer than um, Zainal Abidin bin Ali, even longer than, than Gaddafi in Libya. He's the longest standing uh, uh, prime minister anywhere in the Middle East. And throughout his reign, throughout his, uh, his time in office, the, the amount of human rights abuses that have been documented and that have been reported by, by international human rights organizations is just overwhelming. And what really shocks me is that how come nobody's talking about that? How come nobody seems to condemn the Bahraini regime? They all look at Bahrain as this self-proclaimed business-friendly nation, this island uh, getaway, this, this haven in the, in the, in the, uh, uh, the Arabian Gulf, which... Uh, uh, people perceive as being, you know, business friendly and tourist friendly, well, and it may very well be tourist friendly. What it's not friendly towards is its own people, its own uh, uh, majority population. And as I said, anyone who has even the most basic knowledge of the socio-political history of the country um, and and the perpetual systematic sectarian discrimination imposed on the Shias for decades knows that the uh, uh, the conspiracy theory that these people are are, are linked to foreign um, regimes or that they're they're uh, instigated by people uh, outside the country and all those 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 claims are absolutely baseless and they only serve one purpose this is the same government propaganda, the same government line that's being uh, mentioned over and over again. And it serves one, uh, serves one, one purpose, and that is to give the Bahraini regime an open license to crack down on the pro-democracy demonstrations and, um, and, and, and basically kill them. Definitely. And now that they have Saudi support, there's... Yes. So we're just approaching prey time here in London, so um, we're just um, ending off the show. But I hope the audience at home has heard your points and people begin to take action. But we do thank you, Sayyid Messi, for joining us today. And inshallah, we do have you on Thursday in our Bahrain special show where well, we can continue this interview. So thank you very much and um, God bless you and all the, everyone else who thank are you so uh, working towards um, standing up against oppression. Thank you very much. So the audience at home, thank you. May Allah bless you, inshallah. And let's all pray for the people of Bahrain. Thank you very much, Sayyid Messi. Thank you very much. I really hope that people begin to contemplate on what Sayyid Mehdi has said and begin to take action on the points he's mentioned. You can get in contact with us if you want to ask any questions regarding today's interview. That's all for today. Please do remember the oppressed people in your du'as and in your prayers. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.